Should I start? Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I just realized everyone was looking at me. Um, so, uh, Victoria and I are on vacation, <laughs> and um, I didn't. I only have this one talk on this machine, so um, but it worked out well. Um, but this talk I usually give with Steve Duncombe, and um, I'm not going to be able to do justice to his his ideas the same way he would. I'll do my best. Um, but uh, anyway, in this talk, we're sort of fleshing out some ideas about political art. We've studied, uh, interviewed about 25 different artists that have come through New York in the past two or three years and tried to kind of gather some ways that they measure their effectiveness, how they think about you know what success means when you're trying to change the world through artwork, things like that, and then um, and put these ideas together. So um, I hope to provoke some thoughts here, um, but again, they're still sort of being formed and shaped, so it's a work in progress. Um, the first thing is sort of working with this idea of the myth of the artist that's like locked away in their studio or like the lone genius so that artists are um, isolated they work in their studios they make like some incredible work and then come out into the culture and deliver it to us which has like always been a myth it was kind of interesting going to the van gogh museum a couple days ago and seeing like what what a great job they did at showing those other influences you know um the japanese prints and pointillism and stuff like that you know because in the u.s there's very much i don't know about this here but there's very very much this idea that like artists work alone and they work alone in studios um and that this isn't really true anymore this is a work from an artist in pittsburgh named john rubin and um this is one part of this project he has called the conflict kitchen and they serve only food that the United, from countries that the United States is in conflict with. So this is a, an Iranian takeout restaurant. Prior to this, they had an Afghan restaurant, and right now it's a Venezuelan restaurant. And wrapped, the food is wrapped in this label or package, which I may still have in my pocket, but uh, that has interviews with people uh, living in the U.S. that are Iranian or people in Iran about. Uh, what their perceptions of the US and it's like all written in the first person you, but you don't know who it is so um, this project is really great there's like a, they built a waffle shop next to it where they serve waffles because that's they just had a waffle iron and um, it's only open from 11 p.m. to 3 in the morning on Saturday nights and Friday nights and Saturday nights so you get like a lot of drunk people this is not unusual for you guys, but it's very unusual in Pittsburgh. Drunk people coming in, stumbling in and eating waffles. Um, but at the back of the restaurant is a talk show that's like live streamed. So there's a talk show set. I don't have pictures of it, unfortunately, but you can look up Waffle Shop online. Um, and so this is this guy's art project. So political art now is much more acceptable. Um, there are a lot of artists that want to make change with their work. Um, unfortunately, like our arts education in the U.S. is very slow to catch up, um, and artists basically aren't trained in how to make change, how to make political art that works, how how campaigns work, how social movements work, um, how to affect power, and how to make change. These things aren't taught to artists. It's not part of art education. Um, you might be wondering what I know. Um, so Steve Duncombe was, is a sociologist that I work with. Um, wrote a book called Dream that uh, he spoke here in Amsterdam. Did anybody see that when he was here? Okay, it was great. It was really great. Um, I wasn't here either. But um, and then, so he's written a few books, and he and I have been doing this research for a while. Um, also, an activist, um, and you know, worked in the Lower East Side of New York to keep uh, community gardens alive, things like that. And then there's me. Um, I've been an artist for. 12 years or something, uh, making a lot of different political artwork, also have this background in sociology. Um, and together we've done all this research, uh, interviewing artists firsthand, getting information. So, moving on. Um, for, the first thing is like when we talk about artists wanting to affect change, we kind of need to define what change is. And this is the part that for some artists gets a little bit scary, because we define it as things that are like visible and measurable. So can you see what the change is, and can you measure somehow whether or not it has happened? So, um, uh, so for example, how many people here smoke? 
cigarettes. Uh, how many people know it's going to kill them? Just keep your hands up. If you know that smoking will kill you eventually. Right? So, um, there's this idea that, like, awareness of that is going to keep you from continuing to smoke, right? Like, if you know that, or, I mean, among people that want to stop smoking, it's like, well, this is going to kill you. But that doesn't stop anyone from smoking, right? You, the way that you measure whether or not someone has stopped smoking is you can see them not smoking, and you can measure how much they don't smoke. You know, like, do they smoke zero cigarettes or not? Um, so raising awareness, which is like a thing that comes up quite often, like that artists talk about, is like, I want to raise awareness about this issue, really doesn't do anything. Um, it's a step along the way. But if this is the only, this is crossed out here. I'm missing red. Um, Anyway, um, the raising awareness doesn't doesn't actually make any change. It doesn't make visible change. It doesn't make measurable change. It might be a step that leads to it. It definitely is, right? If people don't aren't aware of like the problem or what they can do about it, they won't do anything. But it's not the ends, right? So um, it's a good thing, but it's not equal change. Um, it's it's important because it leads to something else. So um, if we can't see it change or measure change then it's really about just sort of talking about it. Um, if that's the end result, right? And more about venting. And it doesn't lead anywhere concrete. Um, and today's society really thrives on this kind of idea of venting, right? Getting anger out that leads really to no nothing concrete. Um, that's what keeps the everyday sort of thing going. So, so we've outlined like a few, what we call our uh, fallacies of political art. The first one is what we call political expressionism. So you all know abstract expressionism. Um, the idea is like, these are my struggles, these are my feelings in this moment captured on canvas, right? Um, here. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and so the painting is a ca capturing that person's expression, right? And it's abstract. Um, the idea with political expression is very similar. Um, it's like, these are my personal feelings, my struggles, about politics at this moment, right? So political, politics is a subject matter, it's not something that's affecting power. Um, so a great example of this is um, Richard Serra's drawings of the Abu Ghraib prisoners. Um, so he made a few of these with an oil stick, and there's no doubt that he was angry, you know, outraged at what was going on. But the, I would argue the problem with this is that there's really no new information, right? These images were all over the news at the time um, all it really shows is like it in another form and it's presenting this as outrage right so um, to boil it down and you might not be able to you can't see this at all um, expressing your anger doesn't actually anger doesn't turn into change right getting people angry doesn't necessarily turn into change it might be an important step along the way but it is not change in itself people being angry doesn't is, you know, there's no way to see that, right? Um, all getting people angry does, or expressing your anger through artwork does, is say, I'm angry, and who cares, right? So, um, who cares what one artist thinks about politics? Who cares what their feelings are? Who cares what their struggles are? How is it any different than anyone else's anger, right? Um, and how really does it change anything? So, um, the idea t here too is that it's critical instead of constructive. So it's talking about things that you don't like instead of what you want to make. Um, it's all about you as an artist and not the situation or not about what you want to do, you know, the change that you want to bring about. Um, and it's all about you and that there's no, no real room for participation um, other than sympathetic anger. It's just about how angry you are. So um, our number two fallacy is uh, don't mind me. No, <laughs> it's hard not to. Um, <laughs> here, I'll take that now. So number two is um, that knowledge equals power. This is a kind of a common phrase in, in the U.S. So for example of how this works is um, if you look at this statistic that we made and read through it. So now, now you know the hidden facts, right? But now that you know this, what's going to change? 
Um, a lot of political art functions this way um, on the assumption that there's like this information that people don't know. And once they know it, then the revolution will happen, right? Um, so one example of this uh, in the art world is uh, Hans Hacke made this piece that was shown in the uh, Guggenheim that showed the connections between um, uh, these like slum, slums in New York and uh, the museum trustees, right? So museum trustees of the Guggenheim that were slum lords, basically, and, and literally drawing connections between the board members and these properties. Um, so the, the piece, I mean, it's full of facts, right? Uh, it did actually affect some change. I want to give Hans Hacke some credit. Um, the show was canceled. It was never shown at the Guggenheim. And the curator was fired. So it did change some things. Um, and the third thing is that we all know that there are no more slums in New York because of this piece. Um, but I, we, we chose these artists, Richard Serra, Hans Hock, and there's some other ones because they are like prominent um, and important political artists. And we also think they're really great, but they, we're using them to illustrate some sort of key points here. So um, we, we also like, we're kind of being hard on Hans Hock, but he's no harder than he is on himself. We uh, talked to him one time and we're able to ask him, how, how can you know when you've been successful as an artist? And he answered, um, this question requires one to go around it before one really avoids it. And um, his, uh, well, this idea of knowledge is power, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this information out and things will change, comes, it was effective once when there was a monopoly on information and knowledge, but in nowadays, it's almost like we have access to too much information. The problem isn't that there, the information isn't there, it's just flooded by a lot of other things. Um, and then, then this sort of paralysis sets in in the face of like all this abundance of different facts and different realities and different choices. Um, it also kind of plays into the idea of commodification of knowledge so that it's information is something that you possess and knowing becomes a spectator sport. So like, I know this, therefore I am different and I have changed, but like still the, you know, there are still slums in New York. So um, the, the, the primary, I think, idea behind it though is that there, the lack of action comes from lack of information. And again, this goes back to that, uh, that smoking example, right? Like the fact that you know that smoking is, could eventually kill you doesn't necessarily, that's not why you're, you haven't stopped, right? Um, so my feeling is that people are actually really smart and that they may not know the details or the history or the, all the ins and outs of an issue, but they do understand that something's wrong and they want it to be better. So um, admittedly, the core of this idea is valid in that uh, lack of knowledge may be an obstacle that's preventing change from happening, but where does the lack of knowledge lie? Is it in what the truth actually is or the minutia of how bad the problem is or what steps you can take to actually change it for the better? Like what's the knowledge that needs to get out there, right? For most people, it's like, what do I do? I don't know what to do. Um, so going back to the Sarah example, like torture, we all know it's awful, right? We all saw those Abu Ghraib images and didn't know what to do. Um, so how do we go about stopping it? That's really the, the lack of information that's out there. So uh, number three, kind of related, the truth shall, sh shall set you free. Um, the idea here builds on that knowledge, or uh, knowledge equals power. But the thought here is that um, knowing or the information just isn't real or visceral enough that we need a more um, extreme or more aestheticized version of the truth. So for example, um, again, we're, we're taking the, the best here. Um, Picasso's Guernica. Um, this was a representation of the, you know, the horror of the fascist bombing of the city of Guernica. But did it stop the fascists? Did the bombing stop? Um, did it prompt Western powers to get involved? Um, the logic here is that like revealing deeper, more uncomfortable truth stimulates change. And this is a really deep myth that goes back to the idea of the emperor's new clothes, right? I mean, these are stories we're told as a kid that the emperor, you know, is, is sort of conned into wearing this invisible outfit, telling them that these are the most elegant clothes, are the, are the threads that are so thin that no one can see them, and goes out and parades around. 
and there's a child and the child sees like oh he's not wearing any clothes and when he starts laughing and yelling that he's not wearing any clothes that's when everyone sort of like wakes from their slumber right and sees that the emperor isn't wearing any clothes and throw off their shackles and the revolution comes um, same idea with documentary f photography um, there's a problem with this too in that you're sort of aestheticizing social problems this photo of these kids was actually arranged like he posed them and then took the photo um, so at worst the discussion actually becomes about whether or not it's a good aestheticization of this problem um, rather than changing the situation in the first place um, so social problems and social change in this kind of scenario become uh, an object for contemplation or to look at and perversely or um, yeah perversely appreciation rather than action um, these photos though did affect change because they were part of a larger campaign but when you have like documentary photo photography alone like this it can it can work in that way um, another idea is that we we actually don't have to be journalists right um, so so the artist getting the truth out kind of thing puts us in the role of having to be journalists and there are already journalists out there um, and we can do things that as artists that journalists can't do like we can combine different kinds of practices so as an artist you can unique, uniquely apply your skills as an artist that in ways that journalists never could um, to do more powerful things like journalists can't lie and we can lie right just for an, as an example um, so Another sort of subset of this is this idea of uh, follow me. Um, so you read some article, see a movie, right? And you say, oh my God, this is the most incredible thing. And like you have that kind of awakening, right? And then the way that you get other people to have that same awakening is just lead them down the same path. I read the Bible and then, you know, I discovered Jesus. Um, and now everyone has to read the Bible. Um, or, you know, I saw the inconvenient truth and now I see all, all that's wrong and I've changed. Now everyone else just needs to see this movie. Um, so the problem here is one, it makes you really annoying. Um, the other is that it sort of follows along this kind of stoner thesis that like if all politicians just smoked pot, then everything would be cool, right? <laughs> like just like me. Um, and as we know, this isn't true, like having lived in California while Arnold Schwarzenegger was the, um, was the governor. So anyway, um, fallacy number four, uh, the idea that the whole world is watching. That the bigger the audience that you have, the sooner the change will happen. Um, and I can tell you firsthand that this isn't true. Um, in 2008, me and Andy from the Yes Men, and it, this goes back into my journey, as we can lie as artists. Um, did this project, um, Andy from the Esmond and I and a lot of other people, um, and it got worldwide attention. Um, you know, this is the front page of the newspaper in Mexico. It was put into museums around the world. Um, but media attention, of course, doesn't automatically impact power. Um, it's good, but um, if your work isn't uh, efficacious in the first place, ampl amplifying the effect is really amplifying nothing, right? So um, media is a means to change, but not an end. And this is like sort of true of most of the things I've talked about. It's like these are things that are important along the way, but they are not actually change. Um, and so number five fallacy is that art is change. So that by looking at my art or experiencing my art, that you are participating in some sort of transformative activity. Um, the avant-garde version of this is that um, art can recalibrate the coordinates of reality, thereby reality changes. Um, the surrealist theory is circumventing reality and tapping into the unconscious that you could change society, right? Like by showing them these images and kind of blowing their minds that then they come out of it different. Um, at least the surrealists were serious about social change. A sort of more contemporary example is Shepard Ferry, which just takes radical imagery um, out of like you know the Black Power movement or communist imagery, and then reappropriates it into his own work, um, and I think considers himself a radical, but it's really just like a radical surface. Um, so looking at this work actually doesn't change anything, and worse, it actually I believe may, may move us backward. Um, the last one and the biggest fallacy is that art changes anything at all. 
and um, I could be wrong about this. So, if, you know, prove me wrong. Um, but uh, this poet, W.H. Auden, uh, in his elegy, elegy to the Irish poet and radical, uh, radical William Butler Yeats said, poetry makes nothing happen. That is, art on its own with, uh, makes nothing happen. Um, but Auden goes on to write, it survives in the valley of its making where executives would never want to tamper flows on south from ranches of isolation to the busy griefs, raw towns, and we believe that we believe and die in, it survives a way of happening, a mouth. So Auden denies the political efficacy of poetry on its own in one breath while hinting in its effect in the next. Um, poetry resides in untampered valleys and articulates unutterable fears and hopes. It makes nothing happen, but is a way of happening itself. Um, it demands to be spoken from its mouth, its imaginings flow out to a wider sea. So art is this... Oh. I can still yeah, see my notes. I just... It's not, a, Sorry. it's okay, I have black slides for a little while anyway, so. Um, <laughs> so the, the idea of this, that, I, that, that we think Auden is talking about is that like, uh, poetry on its own doesn't do anything but like linked up with the rest of the world. It can do incredible things. Um, and uh, for artists as a mouth or a voice or an expression, this can have incredible value, especially today. So, um, uh, Oh, almost, okay. Um, the social movements need artists, and so I'm gonna talk about ways that it can work now. Um, the first rule of guerrilla warfare is that know your terrain and use it to its advantage. And today's political top topography is one of signs and symbols, stories and spectacles. Um, it's an aesthetic terrain, right, that we need to sort of know and understand. Um, and as artists, we've been trained in this. So. Getting around here to what works, um, we've been I've been tearing everything apart up to this point, um, and I do want to talk about what what we think works. Um, and so, what I'd like to do is give you sort of an outline, step by step method to make art that actually makes change. Thank you for laughing. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's no way I could do that, and if I did, it'd probably be horrible. Um, your message, your medium, your personality, your skills your campaign, your audience, like all those are very specific to you. Um, so it would really be impossible for me to make some kind of method that all of us could use and would work, right? Um, however, we do have some strategies for thinking about things that could make work more effective. Um, the first one, and again, this gets scary for artists because it, it, it borrows from like business ideas. And the last, the last talk we, we gave, they're like, whoa, you're talking about goals and measurable and visible and they're they were like in a Carnegie Mellon University, right? So the faculty is like, this is what we get from the administration. Like, what are you talking about? Um, I've always been a fan of like borrowing what works, you know? And I've seen this work over and over again. Although artists don't like do it the same way that you would if you were an administrator or, or an institution. But knowing, knowing what you want, right? Knowing what victory is, knowing what winning is. And we, Steve and I also talk a lot about winning and it bothers some people, but. We're Americans, so um, so what what do you want to do beyond raising awareness, right? So you've raised awareness for this issue. Like, what's next? If you if you won everything for a while, like if you everything you were fighting for, you got it. What would be next, right? So figuring out what's way down the road that you want out of the out of you know the world, and it could be like a concrete thing, like you know in the U.S. Uh, last year, it was like we want everyone to have universal health care. This year, we still want everyone to have universal health care because it's not working. But you know, like that—that's a concrete sort of policy thing, right? The other one could be, you know, like my my favorite example is the uh, like the Bodhisattva pledge of like I'm going to uh, or I will not stop until all sentient beating, beings are enlightened, right? 
it's impossible, right? It's like a utopian thing. But like, if you have the idea of like, that's what I want way out there, it makes an easier path forward, right? So if you have this, where did my thing, oh, there it is, okay. So if you have this idea of what you want out on the horizon, it's just like a direction to move in. If you don't have this out on the horizon, you can kind of like scattershot move in all kinds of directions. Um, so the goal, what the goal basically does is just give you direction and give you like, you know, cause you're gonna, I don't know, I come up with all kinds of crazy ideas for stuff. And it's like, wait, what do I really wanna do here? And so that idea of where, the, where you wanna be on the horizon can actually make it easier to do the work. It narrows down your choices a little bit. Um, and what this, what part of the idea of, I think being an artist or a conceptual artist or actually any kind of artist is making conscious choices, right? So we're familiar with this. It's very much part of the training when you're making choices about, you know, medium or context or audience, right? Like I'm gonna make, I'm gonna work in photography or like I'm gonna work outdoors or indoors, whatever it is, you know, like these very simple constraints to put a frame around what you're doing and means like, you know, you don't have to do everything else. This is what I'm focused on. So um, they provide boundaries. They, a frame that you can make decisions within. It's actually a really good thing. Um, and uh, th there's another thing that like painters or anyone who draws usually will talk about, like the first mark that you make on a, on a piece of paper eliminates like 500 or, you know, a thousand other drawings you could make. And then every single mark you make is narrowing it down to that drawing. So like that idea of like focusing on where you want to be. So again, what is your goal? It doesn't have to be a singular goal and I actually encourage people to hold themselves to a double standard. I don't know if this is an idiom that translates, but in the US, the idea of a double standard is actually a really bad thing. Um, for artists, I think it's a great thing. So the idea is that you shoot for a utopia, right? Like you wanna, we wanna enlighten all sentient beings, but, um, and use that as like a compass, right? That's the direction we're heading in. It gives you a kind of sense of internal clarity, right? Um, but know the steps in between. And when you achieve a few steps in between, actually, you know, pat yourself on the back and say like, yeah, I wanted to do this really, this almost impossible thing, but I'm really happy that we got this far. Because if you hold yourself to this really distant standard and don't give yourself any slack, you will burn out and you will get angry. And the world does not need any more burned out angry activists. So, um, so, and there's all these steps that happen in between. Um, this comes from some sort of like communication theory stuff that I studied that I found really interesting. So um, the idea is like how people go about changing behavior. Um, and in the beginning, they need awareness, right? Like uh, if you wanted to, what, what would I want to do? Say I wanted to make a world, you know, more vegetarians in the world, right? So the first step would be like, okay, here's, here's how you would uh, eat better as a vegetarian, why you might want to do that, all that sort of like information stuff. <laughs> The next step for them is actually to consider it, right? So if you have someone that's just really stubborn and loves steaks and hamburgers and stuff, they might never get to this step or they might jump to this step and think, you know what, that's not for me, and go right back. And they might go back and forth like quite a bit. Um, after that, later on, they have to remember that you had this conversation, right? And they're like, oh yeah, you know what, maybe it's a good idea for me to eat a little bit less meat. So when they're at the restaurant, remembering to look at the salad section, instead of just jumping to the entrees. That can be a huge step that people miss, right? So they are aware of all these issues, they sort of thought about it, they agree with you, and they never actually do anything, not because they don't agree, but because they just forgot, right? Um, after that is like when they remember, then to actually order the salad instead of the hamburger. I hope you guys are enjoying my metaphor. You can just sort of fill in whatever your your issue is. But, uh, for the consolidation of the salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so you have to order their salad, right? Because sometimes you might be there sitting there in the restaurant and like, I know I should eat a salad. I remembered all that conversation I had with the PETA activist or whatever, right? But like, you know what? Screw it. I'm getting a hamburger anyway. Um, and then at the end, this consolidation idea is that like that decision becomes automatic and you, you're, you become different, right? And you always, you're now a vegetarian, right? So there's, and there's a bunch of other like sort of smaller steps that happen in between this, but this is one model for looking at it. So um, when you have an idea of what that goal is, right, you know, out on the horizon, um, you can better understand what these intermediate steps are, and you can make projects that address people at these different steps and figure out what's gonna be most effective. Like, do I need to get people 
is awareness our problem or is it they can't remember or that they're not actually do, taking any action and can I make a project that will you know hit this point or this point um, so it makes you it makes you better it makes you it makes your work stronger second thing is to know your message um, if you don't know what you're trying to communicate it's likely that your audience won't know either so you want like a sort of sense of clarity to your to your vision of what you want to communicate so that your output can be focused. Um, now, this doesn't mean that it lacks nuance or that it's not layered or complex, but that you, in your head you have an idea of like what you want people to think, um, as opposed to being muddled. And I'll go into this in a minute. Um, the third thing is work well with others. Be a good collaborator. Be polite. Defer. You know. Um, otherwise, you just no one will want to work with you, <laughs> and you're gonna have to work with a lot of people. The, again, it goes back to that romance of the solitary artist, the working alone in the studio and then coming out to the culture and like bestowing these gifts upon us. Um, certainly, you know, there's no doubt that as artists we need space and time to sort of reflect and create with, without distraction, but you don't have to do it all yourself. Um, this is some work of um, Grand Fury, which was like an AIDS activist group. And, um, you know, there's all kinds of things you can do as uh, to affect change. You can write laws, you can create policy, you can get information out there like a journalist, you can be politicians, but as artists when we limit ourselves to those kinds of roles of like I'm gonna you know create policy or I'm gonna affect this legal structure, we're really limiting ourselves and not um, realizing the different talents that of others that we can work with. So Grand Fury was really great at that and um, they had a uh, ACT UP had an action wing, a legal ring, wing, research and policy groups too but they had this arts group that was you know full of graphic designers that did did these amazing images um, number four is um, make activism artistic so don't limit yourself to making art for the revolution but use your tra training and talent to make the revolution an artistic act in itself um, this is a bad example that's me um, so we this friend of mine Josh and I who's a sign painter, realized that Occupy Boston had really lousy signs that were written with Sharpie on paper. We're like, we know how to make signs, let's go down there and make signs. So this is like at the level of tactics, right? Where, where it's really just working as a prop for the protest or, I mean, it's signage, it's simple. Um, but, um, you know, thinking about a more compelling street theater performance or really thinking about having artists think about strategies and goals, right? So beyond like, we're gonna make you these really amazing puppets for your per for your march or um, we're gonna make better signs is like we're gonna help you with strategies and goals um, so when Steve Duncombe and I do we do these workshops with activists one of the things we do is have them um, do these map mapping exercises and they create um, maps of where they want to get to with their work um, the first pathway to get there is like their normal um, one that they would go through and in this one it shows them traveling through this horrible mountain of uh, money and uh, work and staffing and space issues with like lightning and, and uh, snow falling on them and it ends at a dead end um, and then we have them do a second one which is sort of uh, utopian magical like if everything went your way and you could you know control people's thoughts or like you know like no limits what how would that work and then the third one is more of this hybrid that we call creative activism, which is blending, you know, your your dreams and the practical together. So um, this is an example of that. So um, they find this super helpful, and it enables them as activists. Again, it's like using design thinking or artist thinking to come up with better ways to do their work. Um, okay, but the big question I know a question you guys have been talking about is, but is it art, right? And um, as artists, we don't want to be propagandists. Um, and we're not suggesting that artists become propagandists. Propaganda is really like a black and white thing, right? And here's the black, here's the message, and you fill in the white or the void with it. Um, the idea really is that like you can inject thoughts in people's minds. Um, too much political art falls into this category. And the other problem is that it's authoritarian in its um, nature, right? Um, it's fine if your politics are authoritarian and you want to deliver authoritarian <laughs> messages, but it, as a progressive, it's problematic. Um, and 
I would argue it doesn't actually work, you know. Um, we're rightfully suspicious. Art is less about controlling the outcome of the person think, you know, who, who receives it and more about si stimulating some process that can lead to many outcomes, right? So we're not trying to inject thoughts in people's mind, but I would argue more likely trying to create a situation where a variety of different things could happen that went in a specific direction. I'll give you an example. This is another sort of communication theory thing, re very simple one that you have like the speaker and the audience and um, the uh, speaker comes up with an idea and then they encode that message into speech, right? Like, so you have this thing that you think of, you figure out words to say it, you put it out there, then the audience hears it, it goes into their brain, and then they have that idea. And so this is that, sort of like that hypodermic model, right? And there, in communication, there's a problem if this idea and this idea are different, right? So if I'm talking about one thing and you're thinking about another thing, then this whole thing didn't work and it could be done better. Um, now, that, that idea of like, if there's a differential, there's a problem in art, that makes for really boring art, right? Like if you're like, this is a tree and I look at it, that's a tree, you know, like it's a bad painting, right? So um, I would, I want to propose another, another idea here um, or another way of thinking about the impact of political art and another, another model of communication. And really I should have many artists here and many people in the audience because a lot of times it's like so collaborative, but it's very different, right? So. You have um, an artist who has some sort of clarity of input and intent, right? And they come up with a sort of concept and encode that into an artwork. And then on the other side, the, uh, there are many different messages that the audience gets, right? So that the artwork actually functions more like a prism than a, a means of communication, so that you have your idea coming into it. And it works like a prism in that the more clear you are in projecting that idea, the more clear you are with the idea, the more focused <laughs> that beam of light is, the more likely you get the spectrum on the way out, where people can understand that it has many layers, that there's part of it that might be utopian and another part that might be ironic and another part that's meant to be funny and another part that's meant to be very serious, you know? Um, and this, we're missing red, so there's more colors here, but um, so, the idea really is like clarity in and it brings nuance out on the other side. So um, art is a beautiful and slippery thing and that's one of its strengths, right? It can kind of morph and hybridize any practice, profession, and attitude, possessing all their strengths and none of their weaknesses. Um, artists are unique in having this latitude. Like, you know, uh, we, we can do things that politicians and journalists and everyday people are not really allowed to do because we're artists. And um, that power that we have is to be leveraged and really used. And when we're not using it, it's kind of, it's a shame. So um, another thing I want to mention is that visible and measurable change is a really tough standard to hold one's, oneself to. Um, and it means holding yourself kind of accountable for, like, I'm going to try to do this thing and it might work and it might mean failure. Um, it can be really scary, but it can make for stronger work that's both stronger politically and stronger aesthetically. Um, and that, you know, there's always failure involved. If you're an artist for a while, you'll, you'll get used to that. Um, another thing to keep in mind is that, and this, this I learned the hard way, uh, one piece is not gonna magically transform people. Um, but your career of work in concert with other people's work, artistic, cultural, and political, like working together over time may do that. And that's really the goal. So change doesn't happen overnight. Um, you may win, uh, contribute to like a successful political campaign in the short run or changing the way that we define politics in the very long run, um, but pe be patient and keep working. And um, all of this stuff I'm saying is not meant to be a prescription. Like I said, like I can't deliver you a, like a way to do things, but if you want to affect change, uh, both Steve Duncombe and I think that this using some of these ideas will make you more effective. Um, and you only have so much time and energy to commit to this. Um, you should have an outside life, leisure. Um, eventually you'll die. And um, working with, with a goal means using this finite resource of your limited time and your limited life as efficiently as possible and effectively as possible. So um, if we're gonna call ourselves political or engaged or interventionist artists, then we have a responsibility to hold ourselves 
responsible and think seriously about what it takes to make real change in this world. And we need to ask ourselves, do we want to win? And that's it. Thank you. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Can you pass that water? I have one question. Yeah. Um, I, I enjoyed your presentation. It's a very clear presentation. Um, but for me, there is there is one. Um, you know, towards the end, uh, I felt one 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 area of tension. I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about that, because uh, specifying the artistic. Uh -huh. In the activism, you come up with this model of, um, you said at one point, so clarity and nuance out, right? Um, so, so, so you're using this artistic value of, let's say, ambiguity, but on the other hand, uh, you're also very much... Uh, I might have, I might, that might have been unclear. What I meant was clarity in and nuance comes out. Right. So not out with nuance. I think nuance no, 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 is really no, important. Course, okay, okay, okay. No, but, but the nuance should be the result. Yeah, yeah. So, um, and a certain kind of ambiguity uh, seems to be part of that. Yeah. And I wonder if that is in some way, um, um, if there could be a tension between that and your your, your idea that the change that we want to effect um, should be measurable. Yeah. But I was just wondering, because for me, that feels like to, you know, opposing yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, I, I don't see them as opposing, I think, but let me see if I can explain it in a way that's clear. <laughs> yeah, it's, I, well, to me, part of the real value of the clarity is like knowing, having a long term view of like what you want to, what you want to accomplish. I could probably come all the way. Um, so, and, and nuance may be a really great way to achieve that, right? Um, and if you have, like, like I, I'll use the vegetarian one just because it's a simple example, but like, I want to make more, more vegetarians in the world. Um, there's all kinds of things that, like projects that will move things in that direction for different audiences. and. Um, Without nuance, I don't think it would work at all. You know, um, it, then it becomes propagandistic. So it's, um, yeah. I don't. Does that make sense? It, it, yeah. It, 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 it remains a bit at odds for me. Well, I think that I'm just, our, I'm just curious. You know, yeah. how, how that tension works out in practice. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess for me, it's. I don't. It's. It's uh, really clear so it's hard for me to even imagine how to explain it but um, uh, and so I apologize for that but um, I, I think that to yeah having an idea of what you want as an outcome doesn't mean that you have to do everything to get to that outcome in the most clear and simple ways you know so like that like as hoping, artists hoping, the field and then hoping that it will collapse into a world with less vegetarians is it something like that or with more vegetarians <laughs> is it something like that um, okay, so say I wanted to do that, and I, you know, remember the steps that I showed? Um, like I could have one message that addressed people that were at all those different stages in different ways through one piece. So that piece would have to have a lot of layers and nuance in order to impact all those people in the same way. If I went the clear route, it was gonna, it might be less effective with different groups, right? That might be a way of explaining it. I, I have a little bit of trouble with your uh, conception of propaganda. Because I have the feeling it's a you you take you, you explain propaganda as a kind of black and white tool of communicating one-sided messages from the sender to the audience. But I think yeah. the essence of propaganda is that it's never recognized as such. So it's only in a kind of retrospective way, as you might say, in the 20th century there was uh, there was uh, a question of propaganda. Nazi Germany tried to use artists to implement certain ideological <coughs> ideas, frameworks to the people. Yeah. But the essence of it was that the people did not necessarily experience it as such. Yeah. And I think today it's it's still the case. So for example, if 
if Occupy Amsterdam would be in cons a conspiracy, and yeah. somebody made it up. <coughs> Sorry. No. No, there is there's no stroke bubble. There is no stroke bubble at all. Yeah. Yeah, but we're in the middle. Of, we're, on, we're, we're in the middle of discussion. Never seen me again. No stroke bubble. Please give him a stroke bubble. Come on. Give him a stroke bubble. Somebody give him a stroke bubble. Come on. One, 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 I never knew the solution was so easy because we get people all day in the tent. But maybe if we give them strobe waffles every time they come, they'll they'll just disappear. <laughs> so for, so to, to come back to the to come back to what I was saying, if so if occupy if occupy would be the occupy movement would be a, a conspiracy theory. For, this morning somebody suggested that it was actually that it's not a grassroots movement at all. Then probably one of the most important propagandistic aspects of it is that it has no leader. Because we know that today progressives don't like leaders. They like leaderless movements that have that create an idea of spontaneity. Yeah. So the essence of that propaganda gesture, gesture is that nobody recognizes as such because it promotes itself as a decentralized, non-organized, non-hierarchical, horizontal, grassroots movement. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think you are. Uh, 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 for, for me, in your lecture, you un underestimate the, the meaning of propaganda mm -hmm. today, and also uh, the favor it might benefit, the, the way we might benefit from it ourselves as artists. Hmm. Well, I, I think the model of it being like, we have this message, right? As someone who was going to create a message, the, the, the idea of whether or not people recognize it, I would, yeah, maybe they wouldn't, I don't know. But um, to me, the more important part is that they, as someone who's making a message or designing something as an artist, right? Like, I'm going, I have this to say, I'm going to put it in here as directly as I can, and I want people to receive it as that idea and internalize it. Um, is really limiting, and most artists are not excited about being instrumentalized, right? Like you want to have, you want to be able to. There is like a sense of sort of authorship, right? That you're not just designing a message, but creating something, right? That's bigger. Um, so. Whether or not for for a viewer, yeah, I, I guess I would agree. But as a as someone making something, I think that that's that's the part that um, it's not impossible to do both. I don't see if you're talking about goals and means. To some goals, you know, the means might be a very simple message. I don't think yeah. artists are too good to do that kind of thing. And no, no, I don't think I so either. Artists that make very good work that decided to make propaganda and, and do not uh, apologize for it. Yeah. Um, well, then it works for them, um, and I, I wouldn't try to tell them that it wasn't. Um, but I, I think um, if you if that was the best route to get to whatever goal you were working towards, then great. Um, in my experience, most artists don't like that feeling of um, I'm just making this being so direct that it's actually not interesting. Um, and maybe propaganda isn't the right word to use then. But um, yeah, again, I will always sort of fall back on if it works for you, then great. You know, like I'm just trying to offer things that might work better. And if it doesn't, then it's not useful. So, oh. yeah. I'm losing my voice. I'm going to ask Eric to help me. Um, firstly, just a quote that I uh, read, it's paraphrased, but it gets the point across, I think. The reason that so many in the art world wear black is because they know they are going to a funeral. <laughs> so, secondly, <laughs> secondly uh, a comment. You said earlier that the truth will set you free. Yeah. And you said that sort of. a propaganda uh -huh. or a falsity. I believe that is true if it's knowledge based. But I do believe there might be something called truth. I just wanted to ask a question of everybody here. Does the sun help you feel free? Does the help does the sun help you be free? The sun in the sky. Does it help you be free? Sure. Does anybody disagree with this? Can you think of any situation where this is not truth? If you're stuck in a desert, you can choose to die, kill yourself, you can choose you know, freedom within it. Yeah. 
So if, if, if the answer is asked, I mean, I'd like to discuss it later with anybody that wants to. But if the answer is is it is a truth, then we've got a starting point. Well, the part of. one of the things I, I forgot to mention that I probably should have. One of the problems with the idea of the truth will set you free is that there's more. There's always like multiple truths, and like different people think like, oh, this. Like for me, this is true, and for you, another thing might be true, but like then it becomes an argument about which is true, and whose truth is more valid, and it stalls out there. It is my belief that we all have a part of the truth, and the quicker we come together as one unit, the quicker we will see it. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, think, I think it can also become very misty. Yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, I think we have to. I, if we could do that, I think that'd be great. But um, I think more we have to learn how to exist with the many truths, you know. Yeah. But but how do you like like coming back to the propaganda? Um, like for example, I think you also have a very indirect propaganda, which like creates space for openness. Like for example, here you have in Holland like lots of these participatory workshops when they are making like renovations of new neighborhoods and then everybody can join yeah. and they're like um, they're asked to um, um, to give their contribution and think along and, and sometimes it's even uh, used you know the ideas no, often not though yeah, yeah. And, uh, but I think it's also propaganda it's a propaganda of like this 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 so like social democratic idea of like the, the, the policies of that, the, you know, like we all should have a say, but e eventually it becomes kind of like a very weird compromise. You have great problems. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, <laughs> no, but it's, 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 you know, like you, 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 um, no, I don't, I, I don't say it's my problem. No, moment. I mean, in the US, it's just like a private company comes and they, we're going to do this and then. And then anyone who wants like other kind of development has to argue and say like no we want this and then it becomes like you're never you're rarely invited into that dialogue in the beginning mm. um it all gets screwed up in the end anyway no, but, I, but I, I guess what you're saying is like yeah, it's disingenuous sure. right but I, yeah but i don't think it's also a, a great problem at all really <laughs> okay. really because also specifically here also like we are coming to the square we are occupying the square and then the major is just like relaxed about it. Oh, it's so relaxed, like this Occupy movement on the square. And they, he, he's just leaving us until we're freezing to death. And, uh, and we are leaving, you know, like this, like this, this whole compromise. Uh, 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 so you'd rather be beaten by police. No, no, but it's also, it's also quite, uh, I think it's a... Uh, uh, um, it's like repressive tolerance. Yes. Ah. Yeah. And but I think it's also propaganda, you yeah. know. Like even though it's it it it's not like the way you you showed like yeah, you yeah, have yeah, an idea yeah. and you reject it in the, in your head. It's also propaganda, but it's kind of like a, um, <laughs> of different policies of the policies of uh, well repressive tolerance. But isn't it up to you guys to make the mayor uncomfortable? Huh? Isn't it up to you to make the mayor uncomfortable? Like you're mad because the mayor is not uncomfortable with what you've done. If no, you're, is your goal that I mean, no, I think like, we're not, no. I think we're not mad about it. I think we just, it, it's just a different tactic. But I think on the issue of propaganda, it's much more about how invasive that kind of tolerance can be, and the fact that in, that it's a totally different kind of propaganda. I mean, that it, I lived in both Moscow and in New York, and in a way they were very similar. The difference was that the propaganda in Moscow wasn't working because nobody believed it because it wasn't really very good. Mm -hmm. And in New York, most people did believe it because they were much cleverer at it, and so you didn't recognize it as propaganda. So I think the issue of propaganda is not that it is propaganda, it's how easily it can be recognized as such, mm -hmm. and therefore become ineffective. Become more effective. I think it's not so much about, it's not a, it's not a, it's not, I don't think what Elko was saying was about making a complaint about our situation, it's about broadening the concept of propaganda, as you were suggesting, it's about a one-sided message, and what, what uh, I think yeah. Elke, Elke is, 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 is pointing at is that it works the other way around as well, by providing space or suggesting that you are invited to a dialogue, you will have to come to terms with the person who invites you, and at that moment you are already not in charge of your message anymore, so for example, mm -hmm. You're asking a political artists, or you're suggesting that it might be a good way of working to set your goals. Yeah. Uh, choose your horizon, set your goals. 
That's one of the criticisms of the Occupy movement. Why don't you come with a clear program? Why don't you set your goals? Because at that moment, you will be able to be identified and we can understand what you want and, and as such label you and as such in yeah. incorporate you or define you within the system as we already have it. But the, the other goal so the other way around that has worked very well is like we are not going to set goals and we will not give anyone goals and we will not we will not have a leader, right? Right. And by saying what you're saying is that you have a goal which is basically another world which doesn't fit in the paradigm of what is being discussed and negotiated. So, so I mean, I think this is this is what, what basically Occupy is saying. We want a world in which there is social justice and in which a few bankers bankers don't run the whole financial system and get other people to pay for their losses and themselves make the profits. So I mean, I think that that is a a, a goal. And then I think the picture of the horizon that you had was illustrative that you, you cannot go to the mayor you cannot go to Obama and ask like look uh, uh, we want uh, basically uh, to reorganize the <coughs> entire political system to, to get all the financial lobbies out uh, to get uh, uh, basically re restructure the, the regulation of the financial system. I mean, you have a series of demands that, that are actually beyond the institutions that are supposed to enact those demands. So you will never be able with your goal to go and sit at the negotiating table. And I think this is also like where this kind of expert position of the artists come in, because the artists have always been the experts in dealing with imaginary worlds or other worlds, or the perception of worlds, or the presentation of uh, different worlds, no, and I, I, I think that, that there, uh, there is also the power to, to show this kind of utopian kind of goals. Yeah. And then people, for themselves, they can, it's also, it has an openness to it as well. It's another world, but it's not predefined, and that, that's what would make it propaganda, where we say, okay, I'm an artist and I'm going to advocate for this particular version of state socialism or, or what have you. Mm -hmm. It would be a very different situation than saying like, look, I'm an artist and I'm say like, okay, there's a there's a goal out there on the horizon. I don't know exactly what it is because I cannot clearly see it, but it's somewhere out there and I'm going in that direction uh, and I want people to join me and to do things. Well, I think that, yeah. that would be more my version of it. Yeah. So I had the idea was that I mean, people can plug in, no? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Once you know what, where that long distance one is, there's all kinds of things in the short term. Like, you know, um, I, I use that one because it, it's kind of funny. It's like our goal is to not have goals. Our goal is to not have a clear uh, way that this will end. That's a good one. It, as, you know, with the idea of what Occupy has on the horizon. I think there is something. <coughs> you know, out there, and that the idea is to keep it pretty undefined. Um, so, so there's, like these terms are, are, have all this overlap with how it's used in business and how it's used in institutions, but we can use them in other ways, you know? So, um, you know, li like the definition of propaganda is kind of limiting, the definition of a goal is kind of limiting, but like, it's just a framework to sort of build around, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Can I ask you one thing? I'm uh, really uh, impressed with your uh, presentation, but many points uh, I'm not uh, in the same idea. But you are talking about a certain terminology, very managerial terminology mm -hmm. sometimes. And uh, those are coming from military, then corporations, and then you are proposing it to the artists to communicate and so forth. For me, it, that terminology and the way to, uh, you know, kind of using the enemy's language to achieve things is uh, recreating it and reproducing it. So, um, in a way, I am kind of very shy or finding it a little dangerous uh, to adopt a language and just use it for our goals to achieve something. Mm -hmm. So, uh, how do you? How do you see the language, the medium, and the end to go? Um, 
What did you, you said American practicality? Is that the term you used? Pragmatism. <laughs> Pragmatism. Yeah. Um, um, what I'm trying to say is goal. Um, you know, so it's like part of it is, is just laziness with language. Um, and part of it is because I actually have a lot of respect for advertising, although I, I'm disgusted by it, um, a lot of respect for institutions, military, government, although I'm disgusted by what they do. <laughs> I admire their effectiveness and I admire the way that they plan and I think that it's really smart. And I think that using the same, using what works and as artists, like doing, going about it di differently, um, like we don't have to throw everything out, right? I, I for f when I first, when I, early on when I was an artist, I made a lot of work as a company called the Anti Advertising Agency, and I told everyone I was the CEO, and I hired creative directors, and we made work that was about how horrible advertising was, and we tried to use all their methods as well as we could, and so like I've been doing that kind of thing for a long time, and found that the parts that I could take were really helpful and also how to coexist in it where it's like this is good and this part I will never touch and I'm horrified by and I'll always fight against you know so um, so part of it is laziness part of it is a comfort that has developed over the years um, there's respect too for the parts that work um, and but I, I mean I understand the criticism and I I just don't know don't know what I could do you know <laughs> yeah, like when I say goal, you kind of know what I mean. And when I say, I know I'm using corporate terms, don't be afraid, you can, you're still like, eh, you know, like, and that's probably where you should be, right? <laughs> you know, like you should be, no, I mean, you should stay a little skeptical of those terms. So like, that's, that's the, that's a good spot for me where like, I'm talking about it and I know that it's a little weird. And you know it's a little bit weird, but we are communicating still. It no, keeps us on our also toes. Also, the tactics. Uh, uh, no, I just want to um, learn. Uh, so the tactics. Uh, it's wanted to create uh, because the language is a power, yeah. and all those tactics is a power. And you are totally right. Military, I hate, but it's obsessive. Uh, goal direction is you yeah. said this is your goal go there and do it but all these things uh, we want to unfold and change yeah. and when we use them don't we recreate it in this also you know the uh, same uh, yeah. type of thinking and uh, creation or production so for me i understood what you mean but of course so yeah we yeah each other but I, I personally really uh, afraid of using that because then you are not only repeating what is uh, already existing uh, in the system and everyone's mind, but also uh, reinforcing it even. That fear though, what I worry about, that fear of playing around with this stuff is that if it means not using it at all, right? Like saying like, okay, well business used this once, so that's can't use those terms or I can't use that method or the military uses this so therefore it's off limits and like what are we left with and you know we, we exist in the we li exist in the world in 2011 in this culture and I, I think use it use it and leverage it in ways that they never have and they can't and Occupy. and then when we I guess, <laughs> maybe, maybe. So I found it also somewhat refreshing I mean like, I find creepy. Somehow, <laughs> thing, but I, I think it's also refreshing because uh, for me, and within the art world, uh, of course, I mean, if you go to a major museum or like the, the really the powerful institutions, let's say, uh, there there are this kind of dynamics as in you know, I mean, we're humans, you know, so there, there's there is this kind of dimension there as well. There's power, there is financial interests, uh, and but we're not. You don't usually talk about the same way as oh, in the normal world, no? Yeah. So in the art world, we have a completely different lexicon for talking. I
I think actually, it's not that they have different words. Some of that stuff is not in there at all. Where so I think there's a taboo on this, like, exercising urging that you have power and they might exercise it consciously. Yeah. Which I think is something that's not very practical because I think that if you are aware of what your power is, where it lies, and for example, if you are using these very practical tactics, is to what ends are you using? So well, that's the whole point. It's not like. Well, you shouldn't pretend that you don't have any power and it's are and, not exercising. It's yeah, it's infantilized, right? Like, oh, you're, you just make art and you don't know how to do business or strategize or, um, you know, I, and, it, and it's not, it doesn't come from like, um, one, of the, one of the things I do is teach artists and um, the foundation and like, they can get to like mid-career and not know how to make a budget and will be going successful and going broke. Where everyone around them, but that is actually it's kind of true of me too. But everyone around them is getting paid, and they're not able to figure out a way to make it work for themselves because they're not empowered that way. And so, like, in order to live in the world right now, you kind of have to. I mean, well, I, I think it's actually what what you're saying about like uh, making us lesser of having all over artists. We're like, you don't know how to do business. Let us gallerists handle this. Let the private industry handle this. Let the institutions take care of you. And when they don't, it means you're not successful. Outside of activism. And then, <laughs> in, but I don't know. I'll we'll stop. Mm. There's a small question, fallacy number six, <laughs> which is probably the one I'm working on. So how is it any different from what you... Which one was number six? <laughs> Art can do anything at all. Wait, you weren't so sure about that one. No, it's that <laughs> art. the The idea that art can do any can change anything is a fallacy. Um, yeah, it's meant as a challenge, right? So, like, can art do anything? Can art change anything? And like, I want to really answer that. I want you guys to think about that. You know, um, I think I think that it can. I'm not sure about it alone. I think it working with lots of other, you know, where you're not the legal wing, the policy wing, the, you know, whatever, outreach wing as one person, but working with a group that all those people have those different skills and working in concert, I think, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's more of a, it's said as a statement, but meant as a question. Fallacy number six wasn't necessarily a fallacy then? <laughs> it's just a prompt. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I say I don't do anything, then you might in your head say that's not true. <laughs> you know. Um. And the other thing, um, if you think of uh, art can do anything, I mean, artists are also uh, citizens and all people. I mean, you cannot identify 100% with the things you do, right? Uh -huh. So, is it possible in your Okay. I think it's possible to separate uh, the work from uh, from other activism. Do you always have to join a campaign or uh, uh, an activist um. group as an artist? I personally think no. Um, <coughs> but it's, that's kind of what you're suggesting us that, that we should always kind of bring in our our. No, very little of what I've said. I'd actually say like you should do this. Like if you push back at all, I'll say yeah, maybe not. I know. But you're here <laughs> debunking everything. No, no, it's it's not because it's not. I do believe it, but if you say like this, I don't think this works. I'm not going to say well, you should do it anyway. Well, I'm going to tell you you should do whatever you what think do you works. Think about this? <laughs> um, there is a kind of a holistic idea about what an artist is. Like an artist yeah. is a person and everything that he or she can do in one. You know, yes. you can never just go shopping and not be an artist. I, I kind of reject that idea of the holistic artist. No, yeah. No, I don't um, think so. And I think maybe the best thing you can do at some point can be be a body in a protest. I, you know? Exactly. Um, but I, I think, again, it goes back to that making conscious. choices right like is it best for me to do this now or to like 
be an artist and leverage all the strength that, that has or to be this you know like and so it's not you're not thinking like i'm an artist so i can't i can't help strategize you know or i can't or like i don't know just making mistakes by not thinking it through you know I think it's very interesting how, how, how your whole presentation has a kind of permanent contradiction in itself. That at one hand you're, <laughs> you're, you're proposing a kind of a potential strategy that you are constantly relativating yourself and at the same time you're, being, you're still being, in that you're still being the, like the artist, almost the artist that you criticized Richard Serra from being. You know, yeah, somebody yeah. who's in a permanent ambiguousness, who, I mean, who, who, who explains also his work or position. Well, and such. if I showed you all my work too, you'd be like, that didn't work, that didn't work. And I would too, right. and I would tell you more ways it didn't work. And in that sense, and, and, and in that I also recognize there's still, also when you speak of such a concept of awareness or something, mm -hmm. it's still the, there's still an idea that there's a kind of reality fall, to fall back to, the reality of the vegetarian, for example. Mm -hmm. And in that sense, it's almost as if your as if your as if your uh, um, um, acknowledgement of the potential of corporate language and strategies doesn't go far enough. Because I think that 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 the worst, I mean, that the difficult thing of the situation that we're in is that there is really no reality to fall back to, and there's only the ones that we create. So probably artists are the only one who still keep the illusion up somehow that there is a non-propagandistic real to fall back to one way or another, or to become aware and to suddenly be in that reality once again. So I think in that sense your, your presentation, I'm not at all af uh, uh, afraid of, of, of the dogmatism of it, I'm rather afraid of, of being a dogmatic relativist in a way, mm -hmm. or, or a relativist, relativist dogmatic or something like that, that you wouldn't push it far enough. I think the next step is indeed to accept the fact that as artists we create reality, and if it's not us doing it, then there will be somebody else doing it for us. So it's either ours or the one of our. It's either it's either yeah, yeah, yours yeah, or it's yeah. the one of your opponent that wins. I agree. I agree. I think um, I don't think you can fall like have awareness and then forget, but you can sit at that point and never move, right? Where like war is bad, and I don't know what the next step is, right? Like so, I'm aware that war is bad, but you can't. I mean, you could kind of forget, right? O over years, you could forget. Maybe that would go away. Um, or if there was some kind of new uh, novel thing that was really hard to... You should go, because I hate being in Q&As for too long. Well, I enjoy being in my chat Please, go, go. Great to meet you all. But yeah, it's... Um, yeah, you can't like undo knowing something, really. I don't. I, 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 so yeah, there and there is value in creating awareness, but it's not an end. It's I, like my main thing is that that's not, or that's never where it ends. So anyone who's ever, as an artist, who's been like, I want to raise awareness about this issue, and then I'm like, then what? They always have something else, right? But they don't think like actually, what I want is to stop this from happening, or I want to change this law, or I want this to start happening. You know, whatever it is. But they, they're always in their head, like, I just am going to raise awareness. So I'm going to make a bunch of posters, I'm going to put them up, and then everyone will know. And then it's just kind of the, the like idea or the train of thought trickles out. And it becomes nothing, you know? Or it becomes hope, right? It becomes like, well, maybe I'll do this, and then maybe someone else will do something, and then maybe, right? But like, when you actually think it through, you, you might be able to do more, you know? And if raising awareness is all you can do after you thought it through, then, then at least you're thinking it through, you know. Mm. Difficult, difficult. I think uh, let's, I'll, I'm going to switch off the camera. That's all right, thing. maybe we should stop. Just, yeah. <laughs> and then so, we can start fine. <laughs> 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 let's move these tables back.